Can I start? Yes. Right, is somebody introducing me? <laughs> so it's, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Phil as a speaker. He'll be talking today uh, about quoted domain specific languages, which is his uh, recent work. Uh, and um, I mean, you know, Phil Wadler, what to say? I mean, he's been around for a while and uh, done quite a few amazing things, and I'm really looking forward to his talk. So, okay, so my introduction is I am old. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that introduction. Um, right, so the title of this talk is Everything Old is New Again. It's a very old song. If you came in early, you saw it playing on YouTube. Uh, I, I, if you haven't seen the YouTube clip, go look it up because it's Anne Ryan King, what's not to like. Um, so we're talking about quoted domain specific languages. Oh, right. Um, sorry, we have a prop. How many, I need to explain a technical term. How many people know this term, smuffy? Raise your hand if you know the term smuffy. You know it. You've heard it from me before, okay. Um, so most people don't know the word smuffy. It's French. It's the name, ugh. It's the name of a cute furry animal, like the one on my daughter's head. When my daughter got older, um, she decided that I need this as Smuffy too. So she made one for me. And here it is. Right. It's a Smuffy Lambda. Right. There, there's a picture of it along with the Smuffy Pie that she made for me. Um, and the point of this is many of you come from the practical side. Some of you come from the th theoretical side. Some of you, like Martin, are very good at taking the theory and putting it into practice when you need it. And that is the thing that I wanted to remind you of, is that theory is our cuddly friend. Many people think of theory as, oh, that's too hard for me. No, that's not the point. Theory is not there to make things hard. Theory is there to make things easy for you. When you've got the right theory in your pocket for what you need, it gives you a guide, a very crisp guide, to what you need to do. So if you take away nothing else from this um, talk, take away that theory is your cuddly friend. I know that many people here know that, but what I'd like is for everybody to come away with that as a lesson. Okay, um, and sorry, I started the talk wrong. I should have started it this way. Are there any questions? None yet, okay. You're judging me as a speaker, but I'm judging you as an audience. I will judge you more highly, and I will judge my talk as more successful if you ask lots of questions. So if there's anything you don't understand, please ask a question, okay? So our goal, as um, Tiark mentioned this morning, is and I think this is going to be the goal of many of these things, right? So you can have standalone DSLs or you can have embedded DSLs. And for an embedded DSL, right, how do you integrate your domain-specific language with the host language? That's the key question. And um, many people have solutions to this. And this talk is about a new solution that's wonderful. No, it's not. It's not about a new solution at all. It's about an old solution based on two old ideas. One of them is the notion of quotation, which goes back to Lisp in the 1960s and Lisp macros. And the other is the idea of normalization, which is even older. It goes back to Gensen in 1935. Okay? Um, and it's especially this last bit that's going to be a relevant bit of theory that you can apply to what you're doing. And the one thing that's new in this talk is saying, here, this old idea of Gensens is actually really helpful as a tool for thinking about what we're doing with some domain-specific languages. And of course, I'm going to be working in functional languages. And that's because a functional language is a domain-specific language for creating domain-specific languages. That's really why functional languages are so great. How many people are familiar with Landon's paper, The Next 700 Programming Languages? 
Okay, a tiny number of you. The rest of you pay no attention to this talk. Go to the web, download that paper, and read it. Um, it's by Peter Landon. It's one of the early papers on functional languages. And really, this is exactly the point that he's making. The reason it's called the next 700 languages. What are those? Those are 700 libraries for his functional language that let you deal with different domains. OK, so um, we've used this technique twice. Once for um, embedding SQL within F sharp, and once for embedding Feldspar within Haskell. And I'm mainly going to focus on embedding SQL in F sharp, and then Cheyenne will take over from me at the end and give you a demo of embedding um, Feldspar in Haskell, and we'll have some exercises based on that for this afternoon. What's Feldspar? Um, it's a particular domain specific language for doing signal processing. Oh, I'm supposed to repeat all questions. If I don't repeat the question, um, please remind me. The question was, what is Feldspar? So now we've got the question after the answer, so think of Jeopardy. OK, so here's a typical SQL query. We want to find out who is younger than Alex. Um, so here's our little database. It has one table in it called people, which has two columns, name and age. Alex is 40, Bert is 30, and so on. And we can select. Um, so what we're going to do is write, really what we do is we let u iterate over people and v iterate over people. And when the u names is Alex and the v age is smaller than the u age, then we're going, to, we're going to return the v name in a name column and the v age in an age column. And we get this answer that um, those are the three people that happen to be younger than Alex, OK? You should be bored. Nod your head if you're bored. Um, nod your head if you've understood what I've done so far. Let's try that one. OK, and ask a question if you haven't. Yes? OK, so here's our database. And if we want to integrate this into our programming language, so again, I right, said everything old is new again. Um, the actual framework for the embedding is something called language integrated query, um, due to um, Eric Meyer and others at Microsoft. And in fact, that's based on older ideas from Haskell. Um, so it's a fairly old idea, but again, there's a new twist on it, which goes back directly to Genson's work. I'll explain what that is um, when we get to it. But the old idea is we want to integrate querying a database into our programming language. Um, right? The old way of doing this is you, you represent your SQL square, query as a string or something, but that has uh, lots of drawbacks to it, including being vulnerable to um, injection attacks. So we want to have a nicer way of integrating our queries. So one way of doing this integration is to say, look, we can take this table and just view it as data in our programming language. So in this case, um, we've only got one table. So we've got a record with one entry called people, which is the name of the table. The table we're going to represent as a list. And the list is a list of records with one field for the first column name and one field for the second column age. And in general, a database will be a record of lists of records of scalars where a scalar is a simple data type like string or integer, rather than a structured data type. Uh, and we're using lists because lists are the basic, data uh, the basic collection type in F sharp. In fact, we don't care about the order, so these are really bags. OK, any questions so far? So what we're going to do is, so the type of the database here is what I've said. It's a record of people, of lists, of records which have a, a name field, which is a string, and an age field, which is an integer. And then I've got a new construct in my language called database. When you give it the name of the database, or the URL of the database, and it reads in the entire database as a structure in the language which has that type. So db prime uh, it has this type, big db. And then our query, to find all the people younger than Alex, is going to return um, 
a list of records with a name field and an age field. And how do we do it? So U iterates over the, um, the people table, and V iterates over the people table. And if U's name is Alex and V age is smaller than U age, then return a record with V names and V age. And this gives us the same answer as before. Now you notice that I wrote DB prime and youth's prime here. And within this talk, prime has a particular meaning. It means I wouldn't do that if I were you. So why have I labeled this with a prime? Right? This is nice and simple and easy to follow. What's, what, if anything, is wrong with it? Sorry? It's inefficient. In what way? It has two for loops. Right? So this will take quadratic time in the size of the table. Whereas if we compiled it into SQL, this SQL that I showed you before, right, this would, if you um, have your tables indexed properly, this will run in linear time rather than quadratic time. So it's inefficient in that it takes too long. Is there anything else wrong with it? Hand up in the back. We've created a copy of the database locally. So if our database has just six entries, then this isn't really a big problem. But databases will often have terabytes of data. And if it has terabytes of data, it's a huge problem. If we copy it locally and there are concurrent updates, then that might be a problem as well. OK, but there are at least two problems here. It uses way too much space and way too much time. But other than that, it's perfect. So what can we do about these two problems? So what we're going to do about the problems is we're going to write some stuff in blue. And what writing stuff in blue means is that we have quoted it. And um, how many people are familiar with the idea of quotation and anti-quotation from Lisp? Right, so about half of you. Um, so a quoted term is just a representative is just a representation of that term in the programming language. In other words, a parse tree. So when we write these quote marks, so this is the standard way of quoting things in F-sharp. So this op, um, less than at and at greater than are just quote marks. Anything within quote marks gets parsed and turned into a tree representing that bit of code in a standard way. Um, and then you notice we've got these percent signs here, and that stands for anti-quote, or splice. And that just means this is an expression here. It must evaluate to a parse tree, and you just splice that parse tree into the bigger parse tree. So we just assemble larger parse trees out of smaller parse trees. This is a standard mechanism called quotation and anti-quotation. Uh, you had your hand up. Did you have a question? Oh, how does it know that the type of the database is DB? Yes. Well, in this case, actually, we've told it, right? We've declared the type to be big yeah, DB. Yeah, but, 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 but in general, oh, and um, right. In fact, it, uh, yes, there's a wee bit of magic here, right? Which is database will have different types depending on the schema of the database. And so it needs to figure that out somehow. But I'm not going to go into the details of that right now, if that's OK. Partly because I don't remember them. But there is some mechanism. So, um, I'll list all my colleagues at the end. But the implementation was done by James Cheney. And he figured out the right way to get that information in the .NET framework and do the appropriate thing. It should be something like a macro or some type macro or something. Type like providers. That type of idea. OK, so in F sharp, a good way of doing it is with type providers. That is correct. OK, so back to writing stuff in blue. When I've written something in blue, its type is it's a parse tree. So the type of parse trees, or quotations, in F sharp is written expert, short for expression. And then you write brackets after that, which is the way you do a parameterized type in F sharp. And then after that, in the brackets, you write the type of expression that the type of the value returned by the expression if you actually executed the expression. 
So this is just a parse tree, but if we executed it, it would return a value of the type written in brackets. So now we've quoted this thing. Um, and so it's just a parse tree representing this. And you can see the structure of the parse tree is the exact same as the structure of the SQL we, we had before. Question? Uh, what happens to the name DB? So does the final data that we get when we do the quoting uh, contain the, the name binding to DB? Or is this DB just replaced by the database? Uh, uh, right, so the question is, what happens to DB here? I, I presume you mean small DB. Yeah, small DB. Right, and small DB is bound to something of type expert of big DB. And what is that? It's a call to database. So it turns into a call to database, not the result of a call to database. Are you asking if there's a copy? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm He's asking, does the database actually get copied as in the previous one? And the answer is, of course not, because that would be too inefficient. And so now you're going to say, well, what happens? But that's on the next slide. So let me go to the next slide and tell you how it actually executes before you ask me. So what does run do? So remember, the input to run here is youths, which is this, expre this expression, which is this parse tree. So run is given a parse tree after splicing things together. So run is given a parse tree. What does it do with this parse tree? It's going to simplify the quoted expression. The example I've given you, the quoted expression is already in the simplest possible form. But simplification or normalization will turn out to be very important for other examples that we look at. Once it's normalized, it looks exact, it's an expression in F sharp that looks exactly like an expression in SQL. Right? So you just take your, um, right? So here's our SQL. Right? Select from where. And here's our F sharp. So these two fours turn into the from clause. This if turns into the where clause. And this yield turns into the select clause. So it's a very straightforward translation. Um, so we can translate it to SQL very easily. We then send off the SQL to the database and execute it. And then what comes back is a table. And we turn that table back into a data structure in the host language. We could do that eagerly, or we could do that lazily using streams. Either works. Um, but notice that the answer will generally be much smaller than the entire database, so that that's okay. And now you had a further question. Well, what I still didn't get is, could I just replace the percent DB with the, basically with the text database something? Ah, right. So instead of writing percent DB here, could I have written the text database of people? Exactly. And the answer is yes, because that's exactly what splicing will give you. Okay. Good question. Thank you. I have another one. Another good question. Could we then turn this into a stored procedure? I expect so. I'm not that familiar with stored procedures, but it's yeah, there's got to be a way of doing it. I think you view all the advantages of this. Oh, could we just use stored procedures instead? Well, yeah. no, that will not give you all the advantages of doing this, and I will show you why shortly. Um, OK, and then we get a theorem. right? And the theorem tells us that each run will turn into a legal query as long as the following things are true. right? Your answer type needs to be a list of records of scalars, which we call a flat type. That is, something that corresponds to a table. right? SQL only returns tables, so your better answer better correspond to a table. Um, you better use only permitted operations. Right? I've used for, uh, if, and yield. I've used um, some simple arithmetic and comparison. And all of those are in SQL. But if I use something like recursion, that's not in standard SQL. And that would be hard to translate to SQL. So you've got to use operators that translate to SQL. And you better refer to only one database. Right? We actually got 
as was noted, when we do the copying in, this becomes database of big P people, and this becomes database of big P people. And as long as they all refer to the same database, we're fine. But if we've tried to refer to two different databases, well, an SQL query only accesses one database. So that would be hard. So those are the three things we need to check. Now, those three things are very easy to check, I would claim. You can just run over your code and check them easily. And if they're hard to check in um, F sharp without changing F sharp. So since they're easy to check, we've just left the user to check them. Um, there are other ways around this. For instance, you could write a little preprocessor, something like Lint, that checks this for you. In a language like Haskell, which lets you embed macros in the language, you could use macros to check this for you, or in a language like Scala. So there are ways of doing this in various languages, but to do it in standard F sharp, we've just left it to be checked by hand. And I want to stress that because a standard, most standard embedding techniques don't have that drawback. They will at least um, check that you're using only permitted operations automatically. And many people think that's important. So nope, we don't check that automatically. It's easy for the user to check. If you think it's not easy for the user to check, write a macro if your language lets you do that or write a preprocessor. OK? Now, as I said, this is not a new technique. You can use it in other languages. And other languages do use it. For instance, I would claim that this is the core, or a core, of what you find in LMS. And I'm sure Tiark or Martin will correct me if I get this wrong. Um, but um, in Scala, one way that you could go about writing something that generates SQL is, uh, as I've shown you on the top, but again, that would be um, inefficient for the same reasons as before. So what we want to do is generate SQL. So how do we get to generate SQL? We just write a bit in blue again. And in this case, what we do is we write rep here. And rep, just like expert, is the type of parse trees. So by writing rep here, we say, no, this doesn't denote the value of this type. It denotes a parse tree, which is an expression that returns a value of this type. But in um, Scala, unlike in F sharp, it just uses type inference to determine that this is a parse tree. So I've not written explicit quote and anti-quote marks. That's all done with type inference. And there's a trade-off there, right? You can decide. Um, for yourself, whether you think it's better to have the explicit quote marks that let you tell when you're moving from generation time to runtime, or to just have it implicit. And there are advantages to each. And indeed, I think we need to do some ex empirical experiments to measure which works better in which circumstance. Um, so did you want to add anything to what I'm saying there? OK, so I have to repeat into the microphone everything people say. So Tiak said, I think it's good. OK, so one of the questions was, couldn't you just do this with stored procedures? And the answer is, no, this lets us do lots of things that you couldn't just do with stored procedures, and indeed things that you couldn't necessarily do in link before. So all the queries I'm going to show you now used to run in some version of F sharp, and used, uh, sorry, in F sharp LINQ, language integrated query, and some used to break in other versions of F sharp. And different ones would run or break at different times. In other words, they didn't know an easy way to give you a guarantee of what would work and what would not work. So the most important thing, of course, is you better be able to abstract over values. So here's a query that's a function. Um, so this is just a, a lambda expression. Let's see, how many people are familiar with lambda expressions? Right, pretty much everybody, great. Anybody want to ask a question about them? If, right, if you don't know, now's a really good time to ask a question. OK, either you all know or somebody is shy. Um, right, so this is a function. So it's arguments. Its formal arguments are a and b. And that will be a pair of integers. And then we let ra w range over people. And if a is smaller than w's age, and w's age is smaller than b, then we return the names. These will be the names of all people that are between, with ages between A and B. In this case, everybody whose age is greater than or equal to 30, 
and less than 40. So 30-somethings. Um, now, the way this works is we splice range in, and then we get a function applied to these two arguments. So 30 and 40 are the actual arguments. A and B are the formals. And of course, when you normalize, what you do is you just replace A by 30 and B by 40. So then this parse tree you get out says for WB in database of, of people dot people, if A is, uh, sorry, if 30 is less than or equal to WH and WH is less than 40, then yield name. So that turns into this SQL in a very straightforward way. So notice this normalization step was very important to substitute 30 and 40 for A and B. Any questions? Yeah? Could we need to use the lambda here, or could we just uh, splice in the parameters? Couldn't we just splice in the parameters? Possibly, but I'm going to show you some other examples where we can't, so we'll start with this one. So here's something a bit more complicated. Now I've got a higher order function. So now I'm abstracting not over two values, but over a, an arbitrary predicate. So now we take a single argument, p, which is a predicate, and we let w range over people, and then if p applied to w age uh, holds, then we yield the name. So now I'm going to take satisfies of this predicate. It's a function from x to 30 is smaller than x, and x is less than 40. So uh, now when we set, simplify, p gets replaced by all of this. So now we've got a function applied to w age, so we substitute w age for x, and then we get 30 less than or equal to w age and w age less than 40. And again, it turns into this SQL query. This, I think, would be hard to do with shared procedures. And the man is nodding, so he agrees. OK, so now we can abstract over arbitrary predicates. This is not particularly easy to do in LINQ all the time. It works half the time, and it breaks half the time. The thing that guarantees that it will work is making sure you do a normalization step. So this is what I want to draw your attention to, is that normalization can be very helpful at making things work, and in particular, and ensuring that higher order code that you write normalizes down to first order code. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. So this normalization happens at runtime. The normalization happens at Query generation time, correct. So when we execute run is when the normalization occurs. Could we uh, already see at compile time that run will uh, use this query and could generate the query at compile time? What do you mean by compile time? I mean, so when, uh, basically, we know that we will call run at some point. Oh, OK, okay. so the question is, shouldn't, couldn't we do this at compile time? Exactly. And the answer is, you could if you wanted to, but there are other things that you can't do at compile time. So let me show you one, because that happens to be my next slide. Okay. What if we want dynamically generated queries? Right? Queries generated when we run the generation code. And we need to do this all the time. And indeed, right, what I've given here so here I've got a little way of describing predicates. This is actually a domain-specific language implemented in my domain-specific language, implemented in F Sharp, which is a functional language and hence a domain-specific language for implementing domain-specific languages. So it's a very tiny language of predicates. There are only three alternatives, but you could easily add more. So above means greater than or equal to the given integer. Below means less than the given integer. And and is a um, conjunction of the two predicates. You could add or and logical negation if you wanted to very easily, or other things. Um, and now I'm going to define a function, capital P, which takes one of these predicate trees, right? because this is just a little tree of things, and returns an expert, a quoted term, that is a predicate that, given an integer, returns a Boolean. So we can just look at what the form of T is. It'll be either above or below or and. So if it's above, uh, of a, then it's just the function that returns true if x is greater than or equal a. Now, I've written this percent lift here. Why? Well, because a is an integer, but if we're splicing something in, what we splice in must be an expert of integer. 
So lift converts an integer to the parse tree that represents that integer. And similarly with below, and then and of t and u, of course we just convert t and apply that to x, and convert u and apply that to x, and then take the conjunction of the two. Now remember I said you must only use permitted operators, and that recursion is not permitted in SQL, and yet this is a recursive definition. But that's okay because the recursion is occurring outside the quotes. It's the quoted terms that must only use um, permitted operations. So by using recursion in a standard way, we can build up a quoted term that only uses permitted operations. And so as an example, take p of and of above 30 and below 40. And that, after you do all the conversion and splicing, turns into this big mess. Right? It's a function of x which returns a function of x1, which is true if 30 is less than or equal to x1, and then applies that function to x. And then conjoins that with a function of x2, which returns true if x2 is less than 40, and applies that one to x. But of course, if we simplify, we end up getting this. And that's a problem we've seen before. So if we take satisfies of p of this term, it becomes satisfies of this term, and we already saw that satisfies of that term reduces to this query. So this is a very easy way of generating queries dynamically at runtime, which, for instance, in web applications is what you do all the time. A web application is pretty much a front end that will build up some term, which is then dynamically converted to a query and sent off to the database and then the result printed. Okay? So this used to be very hard to do in F-sharp. It was possible in some versions, and there were long blog posts written describing what you could do and what you couldn't do and how to do it, and similarly for extracting over a predicate. So it used to be doable but hard, and this makes it easy and straightforward. And again, the key ingredient here is that we normalize at the appropriate time. That's what makes it easy. Right? Notice something else, right? This is easy but insane. Right? We're building up this huge term. Who on earth would ever want to do such a thing? But it's fine because we normalize it. And yeah, it's a little bit inefficient, but the normalization time is very tiny compared to the query execution time. And one of the important lessons, I think, in computing is be aware when you don't need to squeeze out that last ounce of efficiency. Sometimes that's really important, but sometimes it doesn't matter. And arguably, things that are done at generation time rather than runtime, we can often afford for those to be less efficient. So this is less efficient, but I claim that's a good thing rather than a bad thing. Tiak. So instead of building this huge term and then applying it, couldn't you? Uh normalize it on the fly while you are building it somehow? Right. So Tiark is saying, instead of building this huge term and then normalizing it, couldn't you normalize as part of the process of building? And that's my next slide. Right. So the way I've done it is I've built this huge thing and normalized it. And um, Tiark is saying quite recently, why don't you just build it in normalized form? And in fact, that's what people do all the time. So um, what they would do is they would have um, p prime, remember what prime means, uh, of a predicate, at the same kind of data structure. And then they take not, they don't return an expert from int to bool. They take an expert of int and return an expert of bool. OK? So now you splice in the x here, and you splice in x here, and now in these terms, right, here x was part of the quoted term, here x is now spliced in. And now if you take this and apply it to, do I have it here? No. Um, if you take the term that we had before, this one has to be normalized to give the right result, but this one will come out in normal form and be normalized for you. So that seems like a win, right? However, there's a problem in F sharp. How would we invoke this? So here's what we did uh, for the version we, we had. 
Here's what you would have to do in um, F sharp. Right now, we need an extra event to pass in. So that would have to be w dot age quoted gets passed in. And now notice something interesting happens here, which is w gets bound in the outer quotation and used in the inner quotation. Now, there are some fancy type systems, such as meta OCaml, which support doing exactly this sort of thing. So if you've got meta OCaml, this is a perfectly fine thing to do. Uh, but if you don't have meta OCaml, if you have F sharp, then this doesn't work. If you try to do this in F sharp, you get an error message. And the error message roughly reads, what are you, crazy? Because what you've done is you're um, binding in one quotation, but using the bound thing in another quotation. And as it happens, that all works out. But if you want to guarantee it works out, you need a complicated type system. Because now you need a type system that says, well, this is a quotation. And not only does it return an int, but also it has a free variable w with this particular type, but with an age field that is an integer. So the types get much more complicated. So some languages support that. And then you could do it this way if you wanted to. And some don't. So the less takeaway lesson here is, if you have a language that doesn't do this, then you can just do this as long as you normalize. So there's an interesting question of when do you want to normalize? Now, this amounts actually, oh, right. So all languages do this, right? This is very standard. And we're doing this other thing instead, and which is less standard. I hope it will become a standard, partly as a result of you guys all learning it at this summer school. But everybody always does it this way, without thinking about it. I do it this way, without thinking about it. So I just assumed we were doing this. I didn't realize, oh no, we're doing that instead. And, I will, and here's a picture of me at the exact moment that I realized, oh, we're doing something different. Um, so this is actually a reconstruction. <laughs> Um, but it is true that the moment I realized it was riding through the meadows with Edinburgh Castle in the background, the light bulb was added. Uh, and it was my daughter who took this photo as a reconstruction. Somebody had a question. Yes. Um, the limitation with the quotation here is that the quotation has three variables. Uh, uh, what do you want to say? Right. So this is done with what are called closed quotations, no free variables. But this requires an open quotation because this quoted bit has a free variable that gets bound elsewhere. Uh, this, this looks related to higher order abstract syntax. Would you agree? So the question is, this looks related to higher order abstract, higher order abstract syntax. Would you agree? Um, if you think it looks related to higher order abstract syntax, and I guess it is, um, I don't think of it in terms of higher order abstract syntax particularly. Indeed, I think of this one more as like higher order abstract syntax. Um, so uh, if you find that a helpful analogy, by all means, make use of it. It's just that in higher order abstract syntax, essentially you fall back to the host language for bindings, which is what you do as well. You fall back to F sharp for your bindings. F sharp function is a function in literal. So I have to repeat the question on the point that in higher order abstract syntax, you fall back to the host language for your bind. Ah, you're talking about the trick for turning this into something. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. So the trick that you need to make this all work is very similar to the trick that people often use to make higher order abstract syntax work. And it does exactly require this equivalent of open quotation. That's a, a useful insight. Thank you. Yeah. I do map function and I expect to capture one one argument, the W, right? In the in the second lambda. Yeah, you have this you W have gets captured, right? I can give by the lambdas saying if that's this where I have to explicitly say the capture, I would just say capture this variable, right? I, mean, I can't repeat the question because I didn't quite follow it. So you okay. So in some languages you have to explicitly say what you capture in a lambda function, saying C plus plus. In some languages, you have to explicitly say, yeah. ah, which free variables are being captured. Yeah. And maybe one way of dealing with this is to have a special language for saying which things are being captured yeah, and deal with it that way. The, the, right. So the point is you need some special trick for dealing with this. Yeah. You need a meta OCaml type system. 
There are ways of dealing with it in Scala. Um, you might do it by listing the captures explicitly, but you need to do something, and that's the point that I'm making. Here, you don't need to do anything except be sure to normalize your quoted terms. Yeah, but the second thing, the thing above, looks like an interpreter from one of the two. Sorry, which looks like an interpreter? The, the thing above. Of course, of course, there is a JIT going on, but it's... One might claim that both of these look a lot like interpreters, and one might claim that's not a bad thing. But you think it's a bad thing. Well, you can do JIT to somehow fight the interpreter, but one thing is. Uh, and if it's interpreted, we might use a JIT or a partial evaluation or something. One. So, right, there's a huge space here. There are many things you can do. I'm just trying to outline QDSLs as one approach, which is based on just manipulating quotes and normalizing them. That doesn't mean there aren't other useful ways of dealing with it. OK? So going back to Tiak's question, why don't we just do it this way? Um, well, the answer is sometimes you can, as long as you can support open quotations. But even then, you get into trouble, it turns out. So there's a standard trick for representing a function from A to B, which is a function from X for A to X for B. And that works fine. There's a standard trick for representing products as well, which is a product A times B can be represented as X for A times X for B. This is a technique, by the way, often used in embedded DSLs, which is why I've labeled this column EDSL. Um, and what about sums? So an X per A plus B, well, clearly we represent by that by an X per of A plus an X per of B. But that doesn't work. It can't work. And the reason why is here, the choice between A and B is made at runtime. Whereas here, we would need to make it at compile time, and we don't know at compile time. So this works out, and this works out, and then here we get into trouble. So when this technique works, it's often a very useful technique, but it doesn't work all the time. If you need to deal with, with sums, it just won't work. You need to find some other way around it. So for instance, some of the work on Feldspar, the original Feldspar, not Q Feldspar, um, took sums and embedded and represented them as products. It basically represented A plus B as the product of A and B and another field to tell you which one you wanted. So you could do it, but it gets messy. Martin is nodding there. Yeah? So but isn't that, again, just a limitation of your, your host language? If you have a host language that supports delimited continuation, then there actually is a standard way of representing that. OK, so Tiark is saying, actually, if you have a host language that supports delimited continuations, there's a standard way of dealing with this. And that's actually a trick I don't know. What is the standard way? Well, you, you split the, the control flow paths, right? and then you assemble the, the results of the two branches into, into a sum again. And how would I summarize that trick in a line like that? Oh, sorry, I should, sub I should repeat what he said. He said you split the control flow path and then bring it back together again. Yes. And if I wanted to summarize that as concisely as that, what would I say? Well, I would need to think about it, I guess. And the answer for how to, to summarize it concisely is he wouldn't try to do that. Um, so I'm sure there are, if in a sufficiently powerful language, and Scala is very, very powerful indeed, other ways of dealing with this, and I'll talk with you offline about what the standard delimited continuation um, approach is. Um, so I'm not actually trying to say our approach is always better. I'm trying to say our approach is simple, and it does work, and it's worth considering. So actually, let me, let me take that back. So I think it would look exactly like that. Oh, he's saying, let me take it back. He thinks that the abbreviation looks exactly like that, but then you're making the, the choice at compile time. I don't understand how that works. But could I deal with that offline instead of now? OK, so there's a, possibly another interesting way of dealing with it. And stand around with me and TRK when TRK explains it to me. But it involves delimited continuations. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear the word delimited continuation, I run screaming from the room. But other very clever people like TRK don't. OK, so to summarize what I just said, right? to use this other technique, one needs open quotations. To use the technique I'm showing you, you can get away with just using closed quotations. And another way of summarizing it is that with closed quotations, what we end up using are quotations of functions, an expert from A to B. Whereas um, with this other technique, you end up using functions of quotations, 
and x bar of a goes to x bar of b. And it's a trade-off. Many people are used to doing things this way. I find this way gets a little bit complicated because you have to remember where does the x bar go and where does it not go, whereas here we just wrap an x bar around the outside. The price we pay for this is we will end up with insane terms, like the one I showed you before, that need to be normalized. So maybe one other point you made, the functions of quotations, maybe there are some cases that somehow it enforces that you have to align the function in a way whenever you're seeing like functions of quotation. But maybe there are some cases that you want to deal also with like com composition of functions also inside your normalization, your specialized normalization to deal with that. But somehow here, they are automatically in line by the interpreter of the host language away. So you won't have like the full kind of view of the, what, what was the composition of functions because they Remember everything you say I have to repeat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I will try to repeat what you just said, which is um, a potential other advantage of the quotation of function approach is that if we're using functions of quotations, an advantage of this is that it normalizes for us automatically. But a disadvantage is that it always normalizes, and you might want to not normalize. And indeed, here, it's very easy to turn off normalization by interposing an additional function that just stands for an uninterpreted constant and says, OK, you can't normalize across this barrier. So here you get control over where you normalize and where you don't, whereas this force might be seen as forcing you to normalize everything. I'm sure that there are techniques here you can use to control how much unfolding you do as well. So if you do that with function of quotation, the type system can actually check that the thing is normalizable as opposed to quotation of functions. Maybe I can write things that will not normalize? So, so the question is, can you check that the thing is normalizable? What kind of guarantees do you get about normalizability? And that is, of course, the subject of the next slide. So um, I'm not allowed to go on to the next slide yet, because there are a couple more questions. Yes? Uh, one practical problem. If you give something like that to other programmers, won't you end up with a wild mixture of both models? If, so the practical question, if you give something like that, I'm not sure what you mean by like that. If, if you give some uh, yeah, framework like that. You know, yeah, I'll, tr I'll, re I'll rephrase the question. If you've got this model and this model, isn't there a problem that very clever people will mix both models and drive people insane. Yes, please stop being so clever. <laughs> yep? So I'm just going to be clear. Uh, the, the last uh, approach that you uh, talked about, you, you can do it in a, in a chart, right? This, uh, oh, between these two approaches, and the question is, could you make use of this second approach in F sharp? And the answer, I think, is no, in that this approach requires open quotation, and F sharp only supports closed quotation. Many other languages do support open quotation, and you could do it in them, but F sharp, as it happens, using the built in quotation mechanism, no. What about taking uh, an expert and just displacing it in a new expression that, that gives you a position from expert to expert, right? Um, because the question is couldn't you just splice it in and that gives you a function from expert to expert? Well, yeah, that's what we've got there, but it doesn't work because to use it, you need to write something like this, which necessarily requires open quotation to pass in an argument. So I think the answer is, in F sharp, which only supports closed quotation, no, you cannot do it the second way. It I just think, doesn't work. Uh, another point, I think uh, you cannot do it in Middle Kernel either. I'm, I'm running it down. You cannot do it in? In Middle Kernel. Middle Kernel. <coughs> I'm sure that there are ways of making this work in Meta OCaml because this is what Meta OCaml is for. Um, but we'll deal with questions about exactly how to make Meta OCaml do this offline, OK? OK. So let's go back to the other question. How do we get some semblance of a guarantee about when normalization is working? Right, Because we're building these insane terms. You really want to be guaranteed that that insanity will go away somehow. So how do we guarantee this? Well, we go back and we study the classic founding paper of our field written by Gerhard Gensen in 1935. Right? And this is why I have him on my t-shirt.
right. So this is um, a photocopy from the original paper. Uh, and Genson's huge insight was that the rules come in pairs, introduction and elimination rules. I'm going to focus on just two of the pairs of rules, the implication pair, which is written here, and the conjunction pair, which is written at the top, and I and and E. I'm going to use exactly the same notation that Genson used. I'm going to make one change, which is that he writes his A's and B's in German, and I'm going to write mine in English. So here they are. So here's the introduction rule. So those brackets around the A mean assume A. And then dot, dot, dot means there's a proof tree here. And B at the bottom says the conclusion of this proof tree is B. So what this rule says is assuming A you can prove B, then you know that A implies B. Um, and this is an introduction rule because A implies B appears below the line. So it's the conclusion of our proof. Let's say I've proved A implies B. How do I make use of that? Well, if I know A implies B, and I also know A, what can I conclude? B, right? which is why I've written B below the line. So an introduction rule has the connective below the line as the conclusion, and an elimination rule has the connective above the line as one of the hypotheses. Uh, and that second rule, by the way, is very old. right? It goes back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, but in the Middle Ages, it was given its name, which is modus ponens. OK, and the, let's look at the rules for. Um, so logic, formal logic, was around for about mm, half a century before Genson put it into this form. And Genson's key insight was not to formalize the logic. His key insight was formalize it with pairs of rules. Um, so what are the pairs of rules for conjunction? Well, if I've proved A and I've proved B, of course I've proved A and B. Um, if I've proved A and B, how can I use that? Well, I can use it two different ways. I can conclude A or I can conclude B. Um, yeah? What's the X? Oh, what is the X? Very good question. So um, that's an assumption. Right? I don't have a proof of A. I've just assumed A. Um, if you have a proof with assumptions in it, then you've not proved the things. You need to discharge every assumption. So what that little x means is this assumption is discharged. It's discharged by this rule, the rule that's labeled with an x. And this, by the way, is one way in which I've differed from um, Genson, because he indicated discharge with numeric superscripts rather than lettered ones, but otherwise it's the same. And then the reason he was interested in this is we could normalize those proofs. And when we normalize the proof, that happens when an introduction rule meets an elimination rule. So if I introduce an implication and then eliminate it immediately, well, I could do that much more simply. Right? Because this is assuming A prove B. Now I've got A implies B, but I've also got a proof of A from which I get B. Well, I could do this much more directly, right? Don't assume A. You've got a proof of A. Use the proof of A. You don't need to assume anything. And everywhere that assumption appears, I will just copy over the proof of A. Notice that assumption might get used many different times. So I'll copy the proof many times, so the proof might get larger. But the proof gets simpler in that this intermediate formula, A implies B, vanishes. Um, similarly, let's say I introduce A and B and then eliminate to get A. OK, well, this is really easy, right? I just proved A to begin with. Just use that proof. So we can get rid of every intermediate formula in these forms. So the way Genson described this is he said, perhaps we may express the essential property of such a normal proof by saying, it is not roundabout. No concepts enter into the proof than those contained in its final result. And their use was therefore essential to the achievement of the result. 
He was particularly concerned with this because it was an easy way to show consistency. Because it was very easy to show that there's no normal proof of false. Right? The way you show the, sorry, I'll return to that in a moment. Right? Provitz, 30 years later, reformulated this as the subformula principle. And he said, every formula occurring in a normal form deduction is, uh, in Genson's system of natural deduction, of A from gamma, so that is gamma is all our assumptions, our undischarged assumptions. A is the formula that we're proving. Um, and everything is going to be either a subformula of A or a subformula of some formula of gamma. That is part of the conclusion or part of one of your hypotheses. In a closed proof with no assumptions, it would be part of the conclusion. So in a closed proof of false, this means the only normal form proof would consist of false and its subformulas. False does not have any subformulas. So that, hence, it's easy to show there are no normal form proofs of false. Right? It's the 1935 equivalent of what part of no don't you understand? Now, okay, I've been talking to you about logic, but we're trying to do programming. But there's this wonderful thing called propositions as types, um, in the, or the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So this is an illustration due to Luca Cardelli of the Curry-Howard homeomorphism, which shows us that implication corresponds to function types, and conjunction corresponds to product types. And lambda calculus goes back to Alonzo Church. And in his typed lambda calculus of 1940, um, he didn't write things out in quite this form. So I've, I've rewritten uh, using isotation. But let x be a free variable. Assume x is a free variable of type A. And build up a term n of type B, which contains x as a free variable. Then lambda x dot n is a function from A to B. And of course, if L is a function from A to B and M is a, a term of type A, L applied to M is a term of type B. If M is a term of type A and N is a term of type B, then MN is a pair whose type is A times B. And if L is an AB pair, the first of L has type A and the second of L has type B. So what is the proof of a conjunction? It's a pair of proofs of the two components. What is a proof that A implies B? It's a function that, given a proof of A, returns a proof of B. And again, we normalize terms. And notice if you have lambda xn applied to m, what we do is we substitute m for each occurrence of x within n. So this is just our notation for substitution. And saying that um, lambda xn applied to m reduces to substitute m for x and n is called beta reduction. That's the technical term for it. But it just means substituting the actual parameter for the formal parameter. Uh, and similarly, there's another rule that says if you have first of the pair mn, that, of course, is just m. So you see that these correspond very precisely to the rules that we saw before. And so this gives us a way of representing, um, of dealing, you, applying the. Uh, so what happens with the subformula principle? It applies directly to our programming languages. It says if you have a term, and you normalize it according to these rules, what are we guaranteed? If none of its free variables is a function, and the conclusion isn't a function, when it's normalized, no functions appear. In other words, if all the free variables are first order, and the result is first order, when it's normalized, it will be first order. That gives us an easy way of making things be first order. And these are the normalization rules. They're pretty standard. Notice that those first two, the beta rules for functions and products, correspond to if you build up terms in normal form to begin with, 
by treating things as expert A to expert B, or expert A times expert B, it's those two rules that you get for free. But the next three rules, well, the next two rules in particular are standard rules for what's called a monad. Um, those two rules you would not get for free. You would need to do some other trick. And I know there are tricks in Scala that build things in normal form that do implement those rules. But you don't get them for free just by saying um, a list is a list of x for of a, which you can't do for the same reason that things go wrong with sums. Uh, and all of these rules are pretty standard. And these are the rules that we apply uh, in F, in our rep, to our representation of quoted terms in F-sharp to normalize things. I want to make one other point here, which is, of course, many different DSLs use normalization rules. If you're doing a QDSL, then the normalization rules that you use would be these, which you define once for the programming language. So it's not once per DSL, it's once per host language that you would need to write a normalizer. And indeed, we're in the pro Cheyenne is in the process now of writing a tool for Haskell that includes a general purpose normalizer that you would then use in building QDSLs within Haskell. So you write the normalizer once. Now, that's the general purpose normalization rules. You might need special purpose rules as well. Yes? Uh, how exactly does the right-hand side of the first rule read? Is it also a substitu substitution? How does the right-hand side of the, ah, right, before I wrote the substitution with um, curly braces and a slash, and now I've written it with square braces and an a, um, assignment symbol. But yes, those are just two different syntaxes for the same thing. Thank you for pointing out that I was inconsistent. I should have been consistent there. So I've explained to you how normalization eliminates higher order functions. But there are other conclusions we can come to as well. Normalization eliminates nested intermediate data. So for instance, if, let's say all the tables that I'm using right, are tables. They're flat. Right? Each table would be a list of records of scalars. Um, let's say the result is a table. It's a list of records of scalars. Maybe in the intermediate expression, I have a list of lists, which you cannot represent in SQL. But normalization guarantees that in the normalized proof, everything is a subformula of one of the hypotheses or of the conclusion. So if no hypothesis and no conclusion has nested lists, the normalized form will not have nested lists. So we're guaranteed that. Um, also, you could use normalization to fuse intermediate arrays. So Cheyenne will be showing you this in Feldspar. But in Feldspar, we have a special type of array that says this is, these are arrays that should be fused away. You have arrays that you keep and arrays that you're guaranteed to get rid of. The arrays that you're guaranteed to get rid of are a different type. That type never appears as, a, um, as the type of one of your free variables. Um, that's one of your arguments, and never appears as the type of your result. Hence, normalization must get rid of it. So I have a longer example with nested intermediate data to make that point about how you can get rid of lists of lists. But I won't show it to you because I'd like to give Cheyenne some time. Um, one thing that you can do, which is in our paper, which was published in ICFP 2013, is using the same technique that I showed you for compiling these little predicate trees. You can do something much more significant, which is compiling all of XPath, or a large subset of XPath, to SQL in a very straightforward way. So that example is in the paper, and you can look it up if you want, but I'm not going to show it to you now. What I will do is give you some results. So again, if you look at our paper, um, here are different queries, and here are their run times in F-sharp 2.0 and F-sharp 3.0 with their standard implementation of LINQ. And you can see that some things run and some things don't run. But all of these satisfy the theorem that I gave you at the beginning, so they all run in our version. Um, and also, remember I said, ah, but you know, you're normalizing things. That takes extra time. 
And I said, but that time will be small compared to the time to execute the query. And even on relatively small tables, this is true. You can see that our normalization time is tiny compared to the um, uh, query runtime. So these times here include the normalization time. It's just to show you that the normalization time is a small fraction of the time. So I wouldn't say it's always true that you could afford the extra time for normalization, but it's often true. So in other words, part of what I said to somebody before, don't be so clever. We often try to be really clever and get the last tiny ounce of performance out. Often it's better to not be clever and to say, no, I'm just going to build up a huge term and normalize it, and the extra time doesn't matter. Sometimes the simple solution works perfectly well. Um, notice, by the way, that in F sharp 3.0, um, this nested example, which I haven't shown you, works, but it actually ends up doing nested queries. So instead of running one query, it executes a series of queries to deal with the nested data structure. And so it, it takes a lot longer than just generating one query. And in fact, by making um, the nested data structure complicated enough, you can make it take arbitrarily longer. Um, these are the times for um, comparing the um, QDSL and EDSL versions of Feldspar, which Cheyenne's going to show you. But again, I just want to make the point that uh, where is the simplification time? Um, you haven't separated out the simplification time. We should do that. Um, but anyhow, the time for EDSL and QDSL doesn't differ by that much. And the point is you want something that when you run it will be fast. And in fact, we generate um, essentially the same code. So, ooh, this one's different. Why is it different? We'll talk about that offline. Um, OK, so let me conclude. There's this quote often attributed to Picasso saying that good artists copy and great artists steal. Uh, it turns out that quote's actually due to Steve Jobs. It was made up by him. Um, this, by the way, is the only place in the whole talk where you see nested quotes. <laughs> and EDSLs, this other technique, um, really the huge advantage of it is that you steal the types of the host language. And you steal some of the syntax of the host language as well. But for things like conditionals in Haskell, you can't steal the syntax. Because in uh, Haskell, the conditional has type if, boolean, then, some expression, otherwise some expression. Whereas for the QDSL technique or the EDSL technique, it would have to have type if expert of boolean, then something else, something else. And in fact, Scala has an extension that lets you deal with, it, with uh, conditionals in that way. Um, but in QDSL, without changing the language at all, you get all the syntax of the host language, not just some of it. And furthermore, you get normalization rules for the host language, um, as well as, of course, getting the types. So arguably, QDSL is a good idea because it steals more from the host language. Question? So uh, why would you not have normalization also for EDSL? So because I know that in final tagless paper, so they are arguing that they are also by tagless encoding, you can have a separate phase of like maybe online in an online way doing normalization as well. Sorry, could you repeat the question? So, so my question is that even with EDSLs, you can have normalization also. Of course, you could do normalizations for an EDSL. EDSLs tend to use a custom deep representation for each domain-specific language, and then you would need a custom normalizer for that deep representation. If you chose to use the same deep representation across a range of EDSLs, then you would get that advantage as well. And arguably, that's exactly what happens in Delight, I guess. Um, so yes, you could use that technique for EDSLs as well. That's a good point. OK. so. Just to conclude, right? how does one integrate a domain-specific language and a host language? I've shown you a technique that depends on using quotation and normalization. 
And I, all right, I hope I've convinced you that theory, no, it should be this way, shouldn't it? That theory is your friend, right? Because it's really some very nice bits of theory that are the foundation of our field, going back to Genson in 1935 and Church in 1940, and then Howard in 1960, who observed that those two things were isomorphic to each other. And we can exploit all that as a guiding principle in designing some DSLs. And these are all the people. Now, I've left you with a quandary, which you have a half hour demo to fit in 15 minutes. We can extend a bit. I have a solution. We'll go later to lunch. We can extend a bit. No, no, there is no need to extend. Okay. You've, you've, okay. Um, anyhow, um, there's where to find the papers uh, that this is based on, including a paper on propositions as types, if you want to understand more about Curry Howard that's coming out in October. And here are all my co-authors. And here is the library for doing queries in F-sharp, which is now um, a part of, of the um, standard F-sharp libraries package. Um, I, although I think not an official Microsoft release. I think they still have their own version of um, queries for L, I, and Q. Uh, OK. Thank you. Phil in, inspired us with his lambda to give uh, a little presents to the speakers. So uh, oh, I would you. like you to take it out. Uh, ah, I can see what this is. <laughs> Indeed, this is a great illustration. I can bring this along. I can say, everybody thinks of lambdas like this, hard. But they are actually Just don't fuzzy. Don't